Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce Jeff Rosenthal, uh, who is a professor at the University of Toronto, and um, I'm sure everyone knows him here. So please go ahead, Jeff, and uh, tell us uh, about MC MCMC confidence intervals. Okay, okay. I go over to you. <laughs> all right, thank you. So first of all, thank you to, uh, to UA for uh, uh, inviting me and uh, organizing everything and also agreeing to do it on Zoom. I know you usually do it on uh, Microsoft Teams, but there can be problems with share screen and everything. And I thought actually I'm more comfortable with Zoom. So he said, no problem, we'll do it on Zoom. And thank you all for uh, coming out and uh, good to see everyone. So um, I, I'm going to talk uh, about a topic which actually is not uh, uh, the sort of thing that I usually talk about because um, I, mean, I do a lot of work, including a lot of work with Gareth, who I'm sure you all know and uh, done a lot of things related to, to um, adaptive MCMC and to uh, diffusion limits of MCMC and convergence rates of MCMC. And I consider those kind of my core areas. But what I'm going to talk about today is really based on just a very short, simple paper I did a few years ago that um, I, uh, I sort of thought is sort of a simple approach to uh, the issue of accuracy of MCMC. And somehow it didn't really get, get uh, taken up very much. And so I thought I'll talk about it a little more partially because um, you know, I'm sort of curious to get your perspective a little more on uh, how this fits in with the grand scheme of uh, MCMC um, analysis. And also I'll mention that uh, in addition to uh, this sort of little paper I did a few years ago, which this is mostly based on, I have some recent follow-up work with the paper. And I wanted to mention that this paper actually has uh, seven authors you might notice. And the other six are all undergraduate students. And it's actually, it was kind of a nice story that I, I taught a large undergraduate course in uh, stochastic processes. And after the course, a bunch of students said, oh, they want to do a research project with me. And I said, look, I'm not going to set up funding for a research project. I'm not going to give you reading course credit and stuff. They said, that's okay. We just want to do it on our own. We don't have to get paid or get any credit. So they were so keen. I sort of set them up as a team of the six of them. And they ended up doing, I think, some, uh, some nice progress on this and actually on some other things too. So nice little story of undergraduates. So part of the reason I wanted to give this talk is to give, give them the credit. But so let me, um, let me just set up. I know I don't need to waste a lot of time on introduction because you all, if you're working with Gareth or coming to the seminar, you know all about MCMC. So I'll just, um, let me start with two quotations. The first one I'll take from Galen Jones, who probably many of you know, he's a researcher in MCMC. And these are actually for some course notes, although he said similar things other times and many people have. So he says, the CLT or the central limit theorem is the basis of all error estimation in Monte Carlo. And uh, I think we've all heard those kind of things, right? Usually you think, well, you want to know about how accurate your Monte Carlo or your MCMC is. Well, no problem. First, you prove convergence to a central limit theorem, and then you use central limit theorems to get things like uh, confidence intervals and bounds on the accuracy and so on. And so I think this is sort of, you know, out there almost all the time. Um, but the point of this project is that maybe we don't need, because CLTs are actually hard to verify, as I'm sure most of you know, and maybe we don't need them. And in fact, I first started thinking about this project a few years ago when I was at a talk and somebody else was giving a talk and they said that again. So they're like, well, of course we need to show a central limit theorem if we want to talk about accuracy of MCMC. And I was just sort of thinking, yeah, if you don't have a central limit theorem, how could it go wrong? And I couldn't see how it could go too wrong somehow. And that's when I started thinking, what if we can't verify a CLT? What can we still say about the accuracy? So that's the theme here. Let me mention one more quotation before I start. And this is from Charlie Geyer, who probably most of you know, one of the uh, early researchers in the sort of uh, theoretical side of MCMC. And in fact, this is from his uh, introductory chapter of the MCMC handbook that probably most of you know. And he says, moreover, bias is about MCMC. So bias is of order n to the minus one, whereas the standard error is of order n to the minus a half. So bias is negligible in sufficiently long runs. And again, probably most of us have seen things like that. And you always have in your head that MCMC bias is order one over n. Whereas the, you know, the, the variance is order one over n, so the standard error is of order one over square root of n. And we sort of have that in our head too. And that'll come up uh, to some extent in the proof of what I'll talk about and then in the subsequent uh, discussion. So those are just kind of quotations to set the scene. And now I'll go ahead. And um, so the basic setup, and I'm just going to make this part very brief because everyone knows these first lines. So normally in MCMC, we have a Markov chain that uh, converted is usually uh, has a stationary distribution pi and it's got some sort of irreducibility and maybe some sort of a periodicity so it's going to converge in distribution to pi and we usually have some functional of interest so some function from our state space to the reals let's say and it has an expected value which i usually write as pi of h or you can write the expected value with respect to pi of h 
And we would like to estimate that, right? So I think we can all agree that's what MCMC is kind of all about. And the typical estimate is just take the average of a bunch of, of the function values over the markup chain. Now you may have a burn in too, so you could think this is maybe only after we've done a burn in, let's say, but the part that we're gonna do, we take an average of a bunch of these uh, different function values and we say, okay, that's how we're gonna estimate it. So of course, what everyone wants to know is how close is this expected value EN and based on N samples, how close is it to pi of H, the expected value that we're hoping to converge to. So I hope that's clear enough so far. No surprises there. And if there are any questions, I don't know what you normally do, but I'm happy to have you uh, unmute and uh, ask if you have any question. But um, anyway, so far, I think this is all something we can agree about. And so, as I already said, and it was in that quotation that usually people use the central limit theorem. So I think you'll all kind of know that I'll go through it quickly anyway, that under some conditions, there is some positive number V, a finite number, such that, well, this EN for large N, as N goes to infinity, is approximately normally distributed with mean approximately given by a pi of H, the thing that we want to estimate, and with variance, which is going down like one over N, so some constant V over N. Or to put it differently, and this is sort of the more mathematical statement, would be to say that if you take the estimate minus the true answer and divide by the square root of this variance, that converges in distribution as n goes to infinity to a normal zero one. So, you know, that's the way a lot of uh, analysis of MCMC goes. And then you say, okay, well, fine. So we know about the normal zero one. It's, for example, it's got, you know, plus or minus 1.96 probability of, uh, has probability about 95%. So as, you know, again, I'm sure in fact, even without MCMC, you've been doing this since your undergraduate stats, you say, well, the probability that the true answer of the thing we want to know is within the estimated value plus or minus 1.96 times this uh, estimated standard deviation is approximately 0.95. And of course, in a statement like this, the random variable is actually EN, right? That's the estimate that's random. Pi of H is a given factor and V is a constant. So we're really saying that this is a random interval and the probability that it includes the true answer is about 95%. So hopefully everybody's with me on that. That's kind of just elementary stats, but it's already using the, the Markov chain central limit theorem, which requires certain conditions, right? So, so this is a 95% confidence interval. Um, but, and again, uh, the uh, Markov chain central limit theorems, they only hold under certain conditions. And um, so I'll just remind us of a few of them. So one is that um, if you have a uniformly ergodic Markov chain, and again, probably most of you know exactly what that means, then as long as your functional has a finite second moment, then it will indeed satisfy a central limit theorem. There'll be some sort of convergence like this. That's a result that goes back some decades. Um, if it is geometrically ergodic, then if you have a two plus delta moment for some positive number delta, then that's sufficient. And we showed if it's uh, reversible, then as long as it just has a second moment, then that's good enough too. So these are just various conditions which say, okay, under these conditions, you'll have a central limit theorem. Um, if Xn is only polynomially ergodic, then um, as long as there's a balance between the uh, moments of H and the polynomial rate of convergence, and this is discussed in paper by Jarner and Roberts, and it says under those conditions, you'll have a central limit theorem too. And there are some other ones too. And um, these are all good theorems, I think, but they all have some problems. And in particular, they all require verifying something like uniform ergodicity or geometric ergodicity or maybe polynomial ergodicity with various rates. And again, a lot of analysis of uh, MCMC starts by saying, you know what, we're going to have to try to prove. And, uh, you know, I've been part of it too. And I think it's great to try to prove the central limit theorems and then use that as part of your estimation. But CLTs don't always hold. So there are various counterexamples. Um, and you know, these are just some of them that are more MCMC related about, this is one from Gareth, which says that the, uh, the putative variance could actually go to infinity for things like independent samplers. One from uh, Ollie Hagstrom, which gives a, um, a more complicated one, which satisfies certain conditions that if it were reversible, we'd know it had a central limit theorem, but it's not reversible and it doesn't have a central limit theorem. So, so sometimes they don't, don't hold. And then we say, well, what if you can't establish a CLT? And of course, if you're thinking of more applied users, it's not really can't, it's like, don't wanna bother, right? I mean, who wants to prove theorems about central limit theorems for markup chains if you're doing applications of MCMC? So, so what do we do? So that's kind of con uh, context. Um, a final thing I'll say in the context is there's some other related results that some of you will know 
For example, Daniel Rudolph has proved things um, which are actually, actually fairly simple. If you know the chain's conductance, which you'll know is to do with uh, the flow of the chain and is related to the uh, geometric ergodicity constant. And it says, well, in terms of the chain's conductance, you can get bounds on the, the, on the, uh, the root mean squared error is what he does for En compared to pi of H. So that's pretty good. And, and they're not even asymptotic. I'll come back to the asymptotic issue later, but, but uh, that's good if you know the conductance of a chain. But on the other hand, um, figuring out what's the conductance of a Markov chain is actually a hard thing. Um, and then there's also results by uh, Chris Ladyshinsky and his supervisors from his thesis, I think, which um, says if you break up the chain into, into uh, regenerations and tours, and again, uh, if you don't know about that, it's not important today, but it's nice work because it says, uh, you can sort of break up the markup chain into IID tours of random length that do random tours. And in terms of the expected values over those tours, you can get CLTs because those tours, as I say, become IID. So that's good too. But again, how are you going to compute the conductance of a typical MCMC chain? And how are you going to compute regenerations and in particular expected values over entire tours, which is what you need for Chris's results? So the point is there's a lot of ways to look at accuracy of MCMC and I think they're, they're good, but most of them require doing something hard, proving something like geometric ergodicity or proving something about conductance or regenerations and so on. So, so that's what I was thinking about while I was sitting in that lecture a few years ago and thinking there must be simpler ways to just get some reasonable bounds on convergence of MCMC and I thought eventually realize it just basically comes down to Chebyshev's inequality. So I'm going to give a complete statement and proof of a pretty simple result, which is why it was just a short paper. And then we'll sort of talk about the context and, and relations of it. But that's the context so far. I could pause if there's any uh, questions again, if anybody feels like unmuting, especially if anything needs clarification, but probably it's, uh, oh yeah, yeah, go ahead, Yuris, yeah. Yeah, maybe just a, a comment. Uh, even if you know that a CLT holds, then estimation of the variance is still like serious, uh, sensitive issue. Let's, let's say. Yeah, yeah that, that's a great comment, Uris. And in fact, um, I'll say more about that too. But I'll have to admit that um, even in my work, you still need to get some estimate of the variance. So that's part of the reason, probably, why I didn't emphasize. Oh, these are terrible because you have to estimate the variance. Well, I need some estimate of the variance too. But it is a good point, and uh, I'll mention something about that later. But thanks for that comment because. Uh, you're right that what is it right now of course in the central limit theorem it's it's a little more complicated in a way because you really need to know this you know this v for this normal convergence whereas in my case you just need more directly just some bound on the variance but it's related and that is a good point thank you uh Uris. um any uh any other things before we go on okay um all right so so here I'll just give a couple of simple of these. I'm almost embarrassed at how elementary they are because I do do harder things too. You have to believe me, but this is uh, not going to be at all hard. So here's a first um, trivial sort of calculation. It says, well, we're interested in, you know, EN, remember, is the estimate we have of, of the expected value of the functional. Pi of H is the true value of, of the estimate. What's the probability you're off by more than, I'll call it A sub N, just for some positive number A N. And well, you can always write it as en minus its expected value plus its expected value minus pi. That's just the same thing. And then by the triangle inequality, well, it can only get bigger if you break it up into the two absolute values. So this so far is trivial. It's just saying that you want to know bounds on your error. Well, you can look at bounds on the, um, the, the estimate minus its expected value plus bounds on the expected value minus pi. And this term is, of course, the bias. And then it didn't highlight very well, but this is the bias of uh, MCMC. And then this is, I guess, related to the standard error, or it's just the absolute error. So, all right. And then um, just rearranging it, I can say, well, it's say, saying that the probability that the, the, the absolute deviation of the estimate from its expected value is bigger than or equal to something, a n minus this bias term. So, so far, that's just a triviality. Can't really argue with that. And um, but then the good news is this, because I've written it as something minus this expected value, that's the usual form for Chebyshev's inequality, right? So Chebyshev's inequality, well, if this right-hand side is positive, which I'll come back to that, because if it's not positive, this next calculation isn't quite right, but you can say, well, fine. So the probability that something, something uh, differs from its mean by more than some positive number is less than or equal to its variance divided by the positive number squared. That's just what Chebyshev's inequality says, right? So. No argument there, I hope. Although, again, if there's any questions, don't uh, hesitate to unmute. But 
Um, okay, so we say, well, okay, fine. So uh, that's just a bound. But then you say, well, is this really going to be very useful for us? Um, and it is already going back to Eurus's point. It is mentioning in terms of variance. So variance will be an issue. But nonetheless, it's really just bounds in terms of variance. So how does this help? Well, at this point, I do need a few assumptions, but they're related to that um, quote from Charlie Geyer, because they're about the order of the variance and the bias. But I'll come back to them. I'm not going to need them all in the end. But let's assume, first of all, that like in the central limit theorem, and again, I'm going to relax this a little bit later, but let's say that if you look at you know n times the variance of these individual expectations, these converge to some number, which is strictly between 0 and infinity, so some positive finite number. And this is just a sort of way of saying that the standard error is order 1 over root n, or the variance is order 1 over n, so that it converges to a standard, um, which is some positive number. And uh, again, this is something I'll come back to, but it's something that's usually assumed, and that's one small part of the central limit theorem. Um, the second thing is in terms of bias. So the way I've written it is look at this bias, which is the expected value of the estimator compared to the actual value of pi of h. And I'll say that it's small o of 1 over root n. That is to say, if you multiply it by square root of n, it still goes to 0. Now, if you believe quotes like Charlie Byer, you say, well, no problem. The bias is usually order 1 over n. So of course, it's smaller order than 1 over root n. So this would be like n to the 1 half times 1 over n, which of course should go to 0. So so at the time when I was writing this paper a few years ago, I thought that's a trivial, you know, this first one is kind of the usual assumption, which is sort of the first step towards the central limit theorem, but I don't want the central limit theorem. And the second one, well, of course that's true because the bias is order one over n, so no problem. But again, I'll come back to that. But for now, let's say we assume those two. And then the third one, and this is actually very close to uh, to Eurus's point, which is that we want to estimate the variance, right? And um, so for my paper from a few years ago, I said, let's assume we have some estimate sigma hat squared n, which converges to be this uh, parameter for the variance from here, this limit of n times the variance. So, so at the time, I thought those are quite mild assumptions. They're you know, what everybody, quote unquote, everybody knows that n times the variance converges to a positive number, that the bias is smaller order than 1 over root n, and that we have some way, which I'll come back to, of estimating the variance. And I say, let's just assume that. Well, then what do we do? And again, if there's any questions, don't hesitate. But um, OK, not hearing any. So um, so the point is, why do I care about the bias? Well, I'm going to maybe I'll, let's see, I, I'll just mention I'm going to go back up. But I'm going to let a n is going to go down like 1 over root n. I'll come back to that. So I can choose any a n. But a n roughly will go down like 1 over root n. So then you say, if the bias is smaller order, then for large n, it hardly matters. So this is kind of like just the variance divided by a n squared. And that's what makes things simpler. So to proceed, I'll let a n again be this particular choice. So for some positive number epsilon, it's basically the square root of v over n alpha. And alpha is going to be the, uh, the confidence level that we're trying to achieve. So it's roughly speaking, a square root of v over n. And then the 1 plus epsilon squared is just to make the, the proof for well, well to, to make it true. So I'll explain that in a second. But anyway, so then we're going to, I'll continue, but just we're going to just continue from here. So the point is, this variance we're going to estimate in terms of the variance estimator. And the denominator, well, we're going to say the bias is smaller order, so it goes away. And under those conditions, everything works out fine. So, so that's kind of where we're at now. So again, not to rush, but I think it's pretty clear cut. So then I say, well, let's take first order as n goes to infinity. And this guy, I think I was talking beforehand to Yuri about the asymptotic nature, whether these are still as n goes to infinity. But I will talk at the end about some non-asymptotic versions too, because uh, you know, really you want to know the accuracy after some finite number of steps, not after uh, infinite number. But anyway, so then you say, well, I just said this, this denominator, this a n minus the bias, which is in the denominator of that Chebyshev's inequality. Well, we can forget about the bias because it's smaller order. So it becomes just a n. And well, the variance of e n, well, we know that n times the variance converges to v. So this becomes the first order v over n. And then, well, we have a consistent estimator for v. So we know that sigma squared n should converge to v. So this should eventually be less than sigma squared n times something a little bit more than 1, because we have a consistent estimator. So, so if you believe those three things, in other words, we're just, again, I'll scroll back up to one second. We're just using this very easy Chebyshev's inequality bound. And we're just saying, well, the denominator, we forget about the bias. And the variance, we use the limiting property and the consistent estimator of it. And then we just plug it in. So we say, well, this, um, this difference, if we take the limb soup as n goes to infinity, uh, so that we're going first order as n goes to infinity, 
then that should be less than or equal to using Chebyshev's inequality and using these substitutions, the variance of En divided by An squared. And then of course I chose An to try to make things cancel out so that in this case, well, the numerator, we know it's this variance is less than or equal to, we have it right here, sigma squared n, one plus epsilon squared over n. So I just stuck that in here. And then divided by, we have an squared. Well, an is a square root. So the square root and the squared cancel. And we're left with underneath the one plus epsilon squared over n alpha. And then everything cancels. So the sigma squared n converges to v and one plus epsilon squared cancels out and one over n cancels out. And this just converges to alpha. So I'll just, uh, Pause for one second on that. Have a drink and say, um, this is uh, you know, a form of, of the kind of thing that I was looking for. It says, well, we'd like to know how far our estimate of the true answer is from the true answer itself. What's the chance it's bigger than or equal to an? And we said by choosing the right an and having some <clears throat> pretty simple, pretty reasonable, I thought, assumptions, then we say this probability is less than or equal to something converging to alpha. Okay. So this, you could think of this as an asymptotic one minus alpha confidence interval, although it's, you should also really call it a, a conservative uh, confidence interval because it's less than or equal to. So we're not saying it's exactly converging to alpha, but it's less than or equal to alpha. So in terms of giving you a guarantee on the accuracy, you know, this is kind of what I was going for. So I, um, you know, so again, you can say en plus or minus an is a one minus alpha. And again, I really should say asymptotic conservative confidence interval, right? But but, and again, we didn't need to verify a CLT. Um, coming back to Eurus's point, we did need some estimate on the variance and I'll come back to that a little bit more. So that's a fair point, but we didn't need any central limit theorem. And um, you know, at the time I thought, yeah, all these talks and papers, everyone says you need a central limit theorem. Well, maybe you don't really need a central limit theorem. So that was kind of my perspective. And to think in terms of numbers, um, so, you know, this is just the formula for AN. And so, for example, most typically alpha might be 0.05 in terms of the confidence you're looking for. And choose, epsilon has to be positive. And by the way, um, it is possible to make a counterexample of epsilon zero. That is, you need a positive epsilon for this limit to work. But, but any positive number works. So it hardly matters. And you can take a very small number. And then it works out to saying that the probability that pi is EN plus or minus 4.48 square root of V over N is going to converge to 95%, or at least to less than or equal to 95%. I really should say less than, but asymptotically 95%. Um, so this should look very similar. It's just like what you get from the central limit theorem, except, well, usually you had plus or minus 1.96. Now it's plus or minus 4.48. And if you divide that multiplies by almost 2.3, just under 2.3. So, so what does that mean? That means if you, you know, yes, you need some bound on the variance, but then you get a confidence interval pretty much just like what you would have gotten with the central limit theorem, except it's 2.3 times as big, right? So now, depending on your perspective, you might think, ooh, 2.3 times as big, that's terrible because we really need as tight a bound as possible. But I think a lot of people, especially more on the, the, the theory and methodology side, would say, look, 2.3 doesn't really matter. You can just run extra iterations to cancel that out. So an extra factor doesn't matter. And you've got a conservative upper bound on the probability. So so that's kind of where things were at a few years ago. And as I say, in a way, it's, it's very simple. I've really given you the whole proof. So unlike most talks where you say, well, the details are in the paper, here's all the details, right? This is the proof. So again, I have done harder things. I hope you believe me, but this is a pretty simple Chebyshev's inequality argument. But when I did it, I kind of thought, you know, people must really do this, but everybody says you need a central limit theorem and so on. So I wasn't quite sure. Um, how it would be received, but well, it got accepted quickly into the um, electronic journal of statistics. I thought that's a good sign. And uh, then I thought, oh, that's good. Maybe now from now on, instead of everyone saying, oh, before you can get MCMC accuracy, you need a central limit theorem. I'll say, no, if you have just some bound on the variance then you can get the simpler method too. But hardly anybody did. So I sort of felt at this point, here's a nice simple thing. It's not that brilliant or novel. And you know, for all I still know, it was already known or used, but I, I didn't really find evidence of it. I thought, surely, whether it's my version or whatever, everyone should use something like this. But nobody did. It's gotten uh, far fewer citations than most of my papers or that I thought it might. So I thought, well, OK, maybe it's um, you know, not that I, don't, I wasn't really sure. And then I noticed people were still talking. And, and uh, yeah, so then I'll say I call this Twitter wars, which is a bit of a, a grand statement. I don't think MCMC theory usually leads to Twitter wars, but there was some discussion on Twitter. So I thought I'd say it that way. So 
So first I noticed some tweets from uh, Michael Betancourt, who I think some of you know. In fact, I believe he was a postdoc at Warwick some years ago, if I'm not mistaken. Anyway, as you probably know, he, he works on Stan and he does a lot of uh, public courses and things. So he's somewhat prominent. And he tweeted a few sort of typical things. So here's one. He said, the, the highest priority in any MCMC analysis is first verifying that an MCMC central limit theory, right? So kind of a typical, um, typical statement. And then the next year, he said something like, you know, we get, we understand this is about the um, effective sample size. He says, you know, we can bound it under the nice conditions where a markup chain Monte Carlo central limit theorem holds. So as you know, more of this, so it's like my paper had no impact. So I, I just replied to his tweet. I said, you know, or even without a central limit theorem. And I put a link to our paper, right? And I thought, oh, that's good. Now I'm getting the word out there. Everybody's going to, you know, pay attention now. And his reply was kind of interesting because he said, how are A1 and A2 verified in practice? So first of all, I'll remind you again, I just repeated from above the A1 and A2. So these were conditions that I thought were just very mild conditions. You know, the first one says, well, the variance is asymptotically order one over N, so it converges to some number. And uh, the other one was that the bias is smaller order because it's usually order one over N. So I thought, well, you know, those are just, everyone agrees with that. It's, you know, it's in the, it's in the uh, Charlie Geyer introduction to MCMC handbook. How could that be wrong, right? So, so I was a little surprised, but then I thought, well, you know, maybe I can just uh, check that more carefully. And um, that's why the more recent work is partially related to this issue of what is this, you know, if you think of this is the bias of MCMC, well, what can we really say about the bias? So it was one of these things where, you know, quote unquote, everybody knows that bias is order one over N. And then I thought, well, yeah, what, what, what can we really say about it? So, so then, and that was the work I started with these undergraduate students that I mentioned. So I think, yeah, what about this MCMC bias? What can we say about that? So, um, so it wasn't too hard to show that, um, well, under some conditions, you'll have the bias will at least be small O of one of one over root N. And uh, in particular, if you're, if you're a polynomial ergodic of order bigger than a half, in fact, if the order is between a half and one, then the bias is actually less than or equal to order n to the minus this polynomial ergodicity order. Maybe I should have written that. So in other words, if you're polynomial ergodic of order m, then the bias is less than or equal to order n to the minus m. Okay, so um, at least for m between a half and one. So it means that if you're polynomial ergodic of order bigger than a half, then it's you know order n to the minus that order, which means it's small o of one over root n. So so that's true if you're polynomial ergodic. And then of course, if you're geometrically ergodic, that's a stronger assumption. So that's pretty good. And it suggests that this um, A2 property, you know, A2 assumption here holds for you know, a fairly general class of MCMC algorithms. But on the other hand, if I want it to be easy to bound the error of MCMC, I don't want you to have to prove that it's polynomial ergodic and compute the order of the polynomial ergodicity. So, um, and in particular, we also showed that in general, you might have the bias could indeed be order one over root n. It doesn't have to be smaller than order one over root n. And it's not too hard to make up counterexamples where you could just have, uh, you know, for example, a, a birth death type chain, or at least we had one where when it goes to zero, it jumps out again, but then otherwise it just very slowly comes back to zero. So you can make it that the, the um, expected value is zero, but if you're away from zero, it can be very slow to come down to zero. And can be slow enough that the probability that you haven't yet come down to zero could actually be, um, uh, you know, could only be the probability that you get to zero could be uh, converting to one slowly. That it takes a long time to get to zero. So, so in other words, it's not too hard to make simple counterexamples, even on a discrete space, where the time it takes you to get back down is actually going to go a slower order. So even after a long time, you still have a decent chance of not having made it back to the center yet. So the bias could be down, going down very slowly. So, so I hated to admit it, but I had to say Michael Bettencourt was right that these are assumptions that I thought were trivial little assumptions, but um, maybe they're not so trivial after all. So what to do about that? And that's when these um, students, I guess, were just trying to do their summer project with me. So I said, let's try to figure this out. And um, so we ended up getting similar, but somewhat improved results, which reduce some of the assumptions. So um, we had a few different versions and I'll just mention a few of those and then I'll, uh, I won't go too much longer, but um, let's say, so first of all, let's just assume that we just have a variance bound that the variance is order one over N. And in fact, I'll just say that the limb soup of N times the variance is less than or equal to V. So that's a, 
weaker condition than saying that n times the variance actually converges to v. Um, it doesn't assume the variance is exactly order one over n, but just it's less than or equal to some constant times one over n as n goes to infinity. Um, so that's a slight, um, slightly simpler version of, I think it was A1 was the variance uh, assumption, but then without any mention of bias, so that's better. So uh, when we realized bias, order of bias was more complicated than I realized or than was implied by certain quotations. But on the other hand, under this uh, you know, somewhat weaker assumption, we still have a very sim a similar uh, theory, well, really the same conclusion. It says that the probability that the estimator differs from the true answer by more than an still, um, you know what, this should actually be less, yeah, this, this has to be less than or equal to again. So I'm sorry, this is a conservative upper bound. I should have said less than or equal to, um, where uh, again, just any positive number epsilon, and this is the same an formula from before. So it's going down like one over root n and with the same constants from before. So once again, it would lead to that, that uh, 4.48 instead of 1.96 in the confidence interval. Um, so we said that's better. And um, yeah, so then you still need a variance bound. And this gets back to Eurus's point. So I squeeze in here that there are, as you know, there's various ways to estimate variance of MCMC. Um, you know, we didn't get into this too much, but of course, from a practical point of view, one thing is just uh, do a whole bunch of repeated runs and get a whole bunch of IID samples of EN and then use that to estimate its variance. Um, um, also, there's things like uh, the integrated autocorrelation time, I'm sure you know, and things like batch means and window estimators. So we didn't get into this too much, but at least uh, in principle, there's ways to estimate the variance. So I still take to heart what uh, Yura said that it's a hard thing too, especially if you want to be confident as opposed to just uh, estimating it from the runs. But but you know, somehow, if you can get some upper bound, maybe just from repeated runs on this value, then that's all you need. Um, I'll just quickly mention the, the proof of this. Um, so what we did is, <clears throat> first of all, proved it assuming, excuse me, assuming that the chain started in stationarity. So there was x0 was distributed according to pi. So in that case, of course, the bias is 0, because you're always in stationarity. And that simplifies part of the proof. You know, you don't have any uh, this, you know, it's even right here, this expected value Vn minus pi h, that's just always zero. So that simplifies a lot of the proof <clears throat> and it all goes through and you get a similar result to before. But then we say, well, that's starting in stationarity. But if you don't start in stationarity, you might have biases. And we now know the bias might only be going to zero pretty slowly. But then we said, well, as long as the markup chain converges asymptotically, which is one of our assumptions throughout, then we say, well, then we can use a coupling argument. So in other words, you can think of having the Xn started at whatever state, you know, for, from, from pi almost every state that it will converge, that's usual MCMC. And then you can imagine having an Xn prime, which starts in stationarity. And then this is a similar trick that's been used in other cases, including some work that I did with uh, Gareth, where we say, well, you know, you've got this um, chain starting not in stationarity and this one starting in stationarity but we know that it eventually converges to pi. So after a large number n, you're within epsilon of pi in terms of total variation distance. And if they're both within epsilon of pi, that means we can couple them together so they become equal, right? So the xn and the xn prime become equal after a while and then stay equal. And of course, the limiting value of en is then going to be the same for both of them. So in other words, it's just sort of a, a, a um, coupling trick, which isn't really related to bounding the errors, but it's just saying that in the limit, EN will be the same in this case for starting in stationarity versus starting somewhere else, which still converges to stationarity. You can couple them jointly. So anyway, so I, I, I'm happy to talk more about that, but for now, I'll just leave it at there to say that that was the proof. So it's a pretty simple proof and it improved the result somewhat. So we thought, you know, to the Michael Bettencourt of the world, well, now we don't even need to worry about the bias anymore. Yes, we still need to bound the variance. and. I don't think there's you know, any way to get around some version of that. And again, thank you once again to Uris for pointing out the difficulties that could be in verifying that, but various techniques, at least from an applied point of view. So we think it's not too bad. And again, compared to proving the existence of a central limit theorem by proving the uh, you know, order of ergodicity and so on, seems like we're eliminating a lot of the problems. So, so that's kind of where um, we're at more recently, but I'll just mention we had a couple other versions in this paper. And I'll mention one which is related to non-asymptotic confidence intervals. So, um, and this gets back, I think it was, uh, Yuri was asking me about this before we, we started the talk today, but um, is to say, well, these are all, you know, they're all in one form or another as n goes to infinity. 
And of course, if you really care about MCMC accuracy, you care about how accurate it is after a finite number of steps. Now, you know, often we say, well, okay, but a large finite number is approximately, you know, equivalent to infinity in some sense, but, but you know, maybe not, not really. So, um, so then we can say, what about a non-asymptotic version? And I should mention that the, um, the, uh, the Rudolph results, which use conductance, and also the Ladusinski results, which mentioned the regeneration and tour structure, which I mentioned earlier, those both are stated in terms of non-asymptotic. So this isn't the first time people have done non-asymptotic accuracy bounds, but most of the confidence interval bounds out there, including all the ones related to central limit theorems, are in one form or another, there is n goes to infinity because the central limit theorem only applies as n goes to infinity. I mean, you can maybe get the uh, correction terms of the central limit theorems, you know, first order correction terms for finite n, but pretty much they're all in one form or another. They're giving the confidence intervals to first order as n goes to infinity. What if it doesn't go to infinity? Well, suppose we just have a fixed n now. So very different in the sense that n is not going to infinity, just a fixed number n. Suppose we again have a bound on variance. So we can't really get away from that. Similar to before, but now it's no longer a limit or a limb soup. It's actually saying just for a fixed n, the variance of the estimator based on n samples times n is less than or equal to some bound. And then we also now need a bound on the bias again. So this is the bad part because we just said, well, maybe it's hard to bound the bias. But on the other hand, you need something, right? If n's not going to infinity, it's not enough just to know the variance. How could it be? Because you could always start farther and farther away. There's, there's going to be no non-trivial upper bound on the accuracy of MCMC for n not going to infinity, which only cares about the variance of the estimator. So, so we need some bound. But once you have some bound, then it's very similar to before. So I'll say that the probably you again have a um, asymptotic conservative one minus alpha confidence interval, where instead of a n, now I've got a b n, and you know the, the proof is pretty similar. So I won't go through it, but you end up with a formula for b n, which is a little bit messy. But um, what does it say? It says well b n is given by this crazy thing. Now in particular, if c is zero, so if we start in um, stationarity, then we can say, well, you know, certain stationarity, then the bias is zero. And in that case, of course, this C over C plus something goes away. So this one minus something is just one and it's back to square root of V over N alpha. So it's exactly what we had before. So in other words, if you start in stationarity or if you just say, well, you've run it for a long time, you've done sufficient burn in. So it's approximately in stationarity. So the bias is close to zero, then the same, uh, asymptotic uh, conservative confidence interval from before still applies, but more generally it might not. And then you need a bound on the bias too, which could be hard, although maybe you can upper bound it. I mean, for example, if the, uh, the functional H is itself bounded, then the bias can never be bigger than the maximum value, or I guess maximum minus minimum value of the, the function. So, so if you have you know, a biased, uh, if you have a, a, a bounded functional, then you get some bound on C anyway, so you don't need to prove anything more. And that might be good enough if you then take a large enough N. So, so things you can do there. So, so, you know, so whether you want to say, well, we're still having the asymptotic bound, but we don't want to prove central limit theorem or, or geometric ergodicity or all these nice things. We just want to have some bound on the variance. Then we get an asymptotic conservative uh, confidence interval. Or we say, well, you know what? We need some bound on the bias, but then we can do a non-asymptotic version. Either way, we get some upper bound on the accuracy of MCMC, not as good as the bounds you get from a central limit theorem, but assuming a lot less and uh, not, not needing to wait for the central limit theorem to, to kick in. So, so that's kind of where things are at. Um, I'm going to wrap up there, but I'd like to hear what people have to say about this. So if you do want to know more about me or all the papers or anything else, they're all on my webpage. But at this point, I think um, I'm going to leave it there. So. Thank you again very much for having me and thanks to you, Ray. And uh, I'm uh, happy to hear what, what you all think or any questions or comments that you have. So thank you very much.